Welcome to episode 007 of Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know, a podcast to feed our curious minds. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and I want to know who you are. I want to know what you do. I want to know why we look so terrible in the Target uh, self-checkout camera recording in progress thing. Come on, seriously. I see the recording in progress thing in other grocery stores where it shows you walking through the door and it's not that bad there's something about the target ones that's just abysmal that clearly matters to me but i want to know what matters to you and why i've spent the past 15 years as a professional bass player that means i've covered a lot of miles and talked with a lot of people I've found that the person deeply interested in a topic is often more interesting than the topic itself and the bigger picture is found in the details that makes for a fantastic excuse to share conversations with people who I think are great. This time on the podcast, we have drummer, educator, transcriptionist, all-around music do-gooder, Tim Buell. Most importantly, perhaps, is that Tim is a fanatic of the James Bond franchise, and it would be a terrible shame if I had done episode 007 without Tim being the guest. Uh, Tim is also the drummer on the outro music of this podcast. Tim and I spend a fair amount of time in the talk you're about to hear talking about how musicians can be their own brand, their own business in the modern landscape. I think it's an exciting topic to hear for those of you who aren't musicians, because those of us who are know that trying to figure out how to navigate craft and expression and art and balance all that against income and security in the modern world is sort of like walking a tightrope with a blindfold on and both your arms tied behind your back. We all know that, and it's sometimes nice to have a good level-headed discussion that isn't just two of us bitching about how the music industry is for people to have like a good understanding of the hustle I hate that word hustle, but it is kind of legitimate towards making a music career. I admire Tim for what he has made of himself. Again, as our generation of musicians was trained to be sidemen, and now we have to figure out how to be brands and singular entities in and of ourselves. He has done an exceptionally good job of that. He's also a drummer that I'm always thinking of having on projects, even though we've actually only played together maybe a half dozen times, and we talk about that a little bit. We met, I think, over 10 years ago on a gig that a drumming friend of mine recommended me for to play bass on, but that drumming friend wasn't going to be there, and so Tim was going to be the guy. We were driving up to Ohio for a one-off gig and driving in the artist's car, and neither Tim nor I drove a stick shift, so the artist had to drive the entire way, and Tim and I just chatted the whole time about a number of various things, which is a gigantic supplement to his exceptional drumming. Ever since, he is a drummer that I like to try and get on the gig whenever I am in a position to be recommending. I could say a lot more here, but that'll get repetitive because I actually spend a little bit of time in this talk showering him with praise because that is the kind of guy I think he is. So we talk about the modern landscape, we talk about drumming, and of course, because it's 007 day, we talk about James Bond. So let's get into it. Here is my chat with Tim Buell. <laughs> I was looking 
looking back through my messages because there was something that you had posted and I thought to myself, like, I should make a note of that to ask you about. And I went back and looked and it had been a story and so it was gone. So probably the one good question that I can ask you for this podcast is okay. escaped into the ether. What, uh, you don't, you don't. You were talking about, you know, doing slow, like slowing stuff down. Yeah. To transcribe. Yeah. But it was just something that like, it wasn't that premise in and of itself it was something like broader like more esoteric that you said and i was like oh yeah like that is great and it made me just think of that but it it was gone which is a bummer i know exactly the clip you're talking about i could probably find it i'll bet you i can find it in i bet you i can find it in under a minute okay game on and then i'll i'll let you prep your your notes or something else while i do it what if i lied though what if it takes me longer i'll abandon ship if it takes me longer but I'm confident. I mean, I started a stopwatch, so yeah. I, I, I love that about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that I don't even have to wonder if you're being serious. Uh, let's see. Well, we'll we'll get to that. Um, realistically, I wanted to start by uh, kissing your ass for a minute. Oh, love it. I'm doing this more with uh, these tapings of uh, hyping people up at the beginning, which is very outside my normal everyday character. I think there's some disconnect in the way that I assume people can understand my sarcasm <laughs> and uh deprecation of people without you know like act uh it, it's honestly something i've been talking about with my therapist a lot lately about uh reevaluating this thing where people have accused me of only giving negative criticism mm. like negative feedback and some of that is like in my like high standards yeah. thing mm -hmm. where like it, it happens a lot around gigs right where in situations where I am a person who whose opinion is valued on the gig, potentially even in band leading situations, any detailed feedback is negative. Good is there's no praise. It's just, OK. Right. And I think that that is something about me that is tied up in like excellence is expected. Yeah. Kind of thing. And so, like, you know, this is a like this is a madman scene. This yeah, is Peggy absolutely. talking to yeah. Don and she being like, well, you never yeah. thank me. And he goes, that's what the money's for. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but yeah, it's that kind of thing where it's just like, you know, excellence is adequate kind of thing. And so yeah. I'm trying to be like better about that because there is the like natural part of me that would think that because I'm having you on, people should know I think you're great. That that is just like an accept. That is just the thing, and we're all starting from that basis. And as I continue on this journey, I realize that that is not, you know, I can take that for granted. I can relate to this very much. So uh, that is why I would like to start by saying that uh, you and are an intimidating piece of musicianship, and it is because you, whether you're actively doing it or not, and I know from conversations with you and also your transparency online sometimes. That you don't have it entirely together. Okay. Being sure. like an oct an octopus of professional musicianship. Yeah. Because that is sort of like you're doing great drumming. You know, you are an educator. Would you call yourself an educator? Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's part of it. Yeah. Some people have a very negative like relationship with the idea yeah. of being like an educator. Yeah, I do understand that. You've got your own podcast going and like you're good at social media as part of this thing. I think I already covered sessions and you still do like a little bit of live playing. So like you have diversified yeah. the musicianship in your life in a lot of ways. Like at this point, how many things do you think would have to fail you mm -hmm. before you go, oh shit? <laughs> Uh, that's that's all very kind. I really appreciate it. And like I can very much relate to you in that sometimes like someone gets done with the show and they're coming off stage and I don't think it was that good. I just yeah. like literally can't bring myself to say anything about it. And, and then so sometimes I'm not saying something because I thought it was bad and I just don't want to lie. But sometimes yeah. I'm like, yeah, it was good. It was a good show and it should have been. So I won't say anything. <laughs> Yeah. When in reality, like, you know, some of my favorite people to be around are the people that like, I know they think I'm great or I know they really appreciate what I do, but they also say it all the time. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I can totally relate to that. But yeah, I mean, I have I have a lot of things going on. And like, I've recently been doing a lot of transcription stuff. And like by transcriptions, I mean, I do transcriptions for clients, like brands that have like online education that they put out or yeah. Um, drummers that have books that need to be redone or courses that need sheet music, things yeah. like that with it. And I've been doing a lot of that. 
and I get into this weird thing where like I do a lot of that and then I go like, well, damn, I'm not even a drummer anymore. I'm just a trans a, a drummer that transcribes stuff or whatever. So I do have a lot of things and I am very thankful for them. But it is this weird world of like, if you're not careful, you can like and I like that you mentioned like some people don't like to be called an educator. I think some of what that comes from for people is like. They don't want to be pigeonholed as that thing because if they are, people yeah. might forget that they're this other thing. I definitely suffer from that. Some of it is just imposter syndrome. Like, sure. like this year I've been doing so much transcription stuff. I'm like, well, am I even a drummer anymore? And I have been doing sessions and that stuff. But when I look back at last year's income, I have a spreadsheet that I track all my revenue from. And one of the columns is like, what kind of work was it? Yeah which like isn't necessarily important for tax reasons, but is important for me to know what the hell I spend my time doing. Of and um, sessions were like far and away the thing that made me the most money. So yeah. I was like, oh, okay, wow. Okay, like I am playing drums and getting paid for it. That's great. But like sometimes it doesn't feel like it because I do have all these other aspects that I work on. And I think, I don't know if it's so much like would one of them failing be what would cause me to like become a banker or whatever. But I, I do think that like I have to be careful about not getting too far down one of the rabbit holes and neglecting the other ones. Yeah. Because that that to me is where I personally just start to like if I get too far away from drums, because there was a period of time where I was like, I just want to do online courses. That'll be great. That's scalable yeah. or whatever. And I hated it. I wanted to die. When that was all I was thinking about, I really just it was miserable, man. I like I have no idea how I, I've worked for several people that they make an incredible living doing that. I could never do it because it's not playing drums. Yeah. Playing drums is such a small aspect of that. So I think the thing I have to be really careful of is like, I don't think one of them would take me out. I think I would take myself out of the game and I would go start working at Target or something if I spent too long like not leaving this room and just transcribing like weird um, sleep token songs for people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are a few things tied up in that. One is that I hope that you at least for yourself recognize the accomplishment in having it in the first place. The way that I, you know, I've been better about this in the past couple of years, thank God. For a long time, it was a matter of I would end up in one spot. And then when that crashed out, then I'd be yeah. lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a matter of just being mad at myself for not setting it up better. Yeah, yeah, yeah in the first place. So the fact that you've done it in the first place is well, like man, an accomplishment for sure. This is my hope for the pandemic is like the pandemic was so hard on so many musicians and it was like so shitty. But what I was hoping it would be like a huge like lesson for a lot of people because like I feel like leading up to the pandemic, I kind of had a jump start on all this stuff. Like, like you're saying, I diversified, started doing all these things when I took a step back from like only being on the road. And I would talk to musicians and like people like you or whoever be like, I got this idea for a podcast. Oh, I, 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 I really like making like guitar pedals, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, dude, do it. Yeah. Ama like um, amazing. Like just start doing it. And they'd be like, oh, well, I'm still on the road. Like I don't think it generate. And I'm like, okay, then just do one a month. Build one guitar pedal a month or like put out one yep. podcast a month. But like have it up and running. And then if it turns into something huge and great and big money maker venture amazing if it doesn't well you wanted to do it because it was a passion of yours anyway so hopefully it, you still get something out of it yeah but then if something like a pandemic happens <laughs> you already have 50 podcast episodes out it's much easier to get sponsorships for your podcast if you have 50 episodes out and actual listeners than it is to get sponsors when you have no podcast and no listeners <laughs> right absolutely and i was hoping that the pandemic like through force would kind of show musicians like it doesn't have to be there is a world where like you can tour still and have that be your main thing and then not have to take like those two or three in town gigs that like kind of crush your soul a little bit because like the musicians that you're working with aren't your favorite or what like whatever the thing or it's like you know really late hours and you want to be home when you're when you're home you want to be like able to spend time with your family whatever it is you, you can say no to those yeah, because you have this podcast that earns you the you know offsets the hundred, couple hundred, couple you know a thousand bucks that you would have made from these other things. But it's hard to maintain, and you really do have to like kind of start thinking that you you yourself are a business, yeah, and that you are yeah. an artist. And people don't even within our industry. Like I was recently talking to 
uh, I, on my podcast, I had this engineer uh, who mixed this Holly Humberstone record that I really love. Have you checked out Holly Humberstone? Uh, no. I, oh. I mean, I've heard probably like one or two songs, but like, what record is it? Like the new one uh, or like newest? Uh, Paint Paint My Bedroom Black, I think is the name of the, that. that's cool. the lead single off the album. I don't remember like, but it's so, dude, it's so good. And Lee Smith, the guy that mixed it, and he also played drums on it. So like, I was, I just think it's funny. Like, I feel like most of the albums I love end up having great drums on them. And then they're almost always like engineered by the person that made drums, <laughs> made the drums. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's yeah. just like how it worked. Like, Eric Valentine, one of my favorite producers ever, he's a great yeah. drummer, like, you know. But I was talking to him and he was saying like, he has an agent. And he and I were talking about like, what's it like having an agent? Because you're an engineer, blah, blah, blah. And he was just talking about how much he likes it. I was like, man, that's kind of crazy. And he was like, yeah, I mean, you should look into it. Like, you're, a, you're an artist. You have this podcast. You have a YouTube channel. You have an Instagram. You have you play, you do clinics, you like, you can, you do what an artist does. You just call yourself a drummer, not an artist, but like yeah. you have music, you have like, and I was like, that's interesting. And I, like, even in our town of people that are like, you know, agents and representation or whatever, um, I talked to a couple different companies and I talked to a couple of people that I know really well that work at companies. They're like, yeah, man, I don't know. Like, we don't like, we don't like deal with drummers. And I was like, yeah, okay. Imagine yeah. if, though, <laughs> you didn't know I played drums and I was just another musician and you thought of me like the musicians you represent, but they won't do it because like anyone that gets hired to be a musician is not an artist, I feel like is kind of the mindset yeah. or or doesn't have a business. And it's like, well, that's just not true. I mean, that's man, this is such a. All right, here we go. Buckle in. We're going to uh, Nashville bash for a little while. Uh, listen, man. There are so many things that scared. are specific to the Nashville music ecosystem that don't register in other places, right? Yeah. Or other genres. Not to really hammer home the idea that Nashville is a country town as much as it used to be anymore, but I'll get to the genre thing in a minute. But like the th reason I said what I said before about people feeling weird about being called educators is because that's such a New York thing. Yeah. New York is full of musicians who can't, even at their height, make ends meet playing gigs and doing sessions in New York. And so everybody is teaching lessons. On yeah. The side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, none of them want to be known as educators because that is their teaching lessons is definitely their side hustle. Right. Right. You right. know, and like so it makes people jumpy in a town like that. Genre wise, the thing that you are describing in terms of being a drummer that is a brand or an artist or things like that, man, jazz players have had that nailed for so long. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the easiest example, right, are like all the musicians that played for Miles Davis, you know, were recording on the side as leaders. Yeah. And that happens, you know, with everybody, but it's that kind of thing where it's like, well, this is the biggest thing that I do, but I'm over here doing this thing. Yeah. And that is as valid. You are doing that. It's just that nothing in the business infrastructure here is set up to accept that. Yeah. I mean, it would take like a a, a mind shift in the thinking of it. But like, to me, I just look at it from like, because I feel like there's so many people that are musicians that'll talk about like some kind of, you know, they'll have some kind of gripe about the music industry and it'll be very like specifically, well, the music industry, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, no, every industry like has that. That is just well, like yes. business, right? And I yeah. feel like I'm not, I'm not like some like crypto bro trying to like shill you my like uh, get rich quick scheme. <laughs> but like yeah. it is important to think about like basic foundational building blocks of business and think about like, because you, you know, you started talking about like diversifying what you're doing and having all these different things. Like one of the things that I thought about was like when you really think about it, like as a musician, as someone who gets hired by other people or just a musician in general. Like yeah. if the only service you offer is like playing a gig for, you know, some artist that needs a live drummer, a live bass player or whatever, um, yeah. that's like kind of an expensive service. Yeah. You know, that's several hundreds of dollars that you're paying. Uh, and that's like the equivalent of walking into Target and there only being like the bottles of wine we were talking about earlier. We were yeah. talking about these expensive bottles of wine or whatever. It's like, that's certainly a product that does get sold, but like, it's pretty rare that like a ton of people want to buy that thing. So yeah, a as a musician, it's like, well, what else can you do that 
gives you a couple more things you can sell that aren't just this one really expensive, like you have to be there in physical form, having learned a bunch of music, all these things. Like there's so many stipulations and it's a, it's a bunch of money at the end of the day. Like there's just not that many things that like people are paying like 500 and $600 for every day. <laughs> that's, yeah, like, right. that's a huge cost. <laughs> but a sample pack for 10 bucks is something that a lot of people could be interested in. Oh, yeah. I just started to think more and more like that where it was like, well, okay. Like no one told me I could like sell the service of transcribing drum solos in college. And I went to a yeah. music college where they should have you know, they should have been the most encouraging about different ways or whatever. But everybody was essentially like, you play live, you do studio, you teach. Those are the things that you do to make money as yeah. a musician. And it's like, well, yeah, but also there's like so many other ways that you can do it. And sure, some of them, like some months earn me $80, but some months it's $2,000. Yeah. And sure, if that's the only thing you do, that's gonna that's quite a big dip in rise for you to kind of juggle. But like, if that's all stuff that is recurring over your whole lifetime because of these like things that you put out in the world, um, yeah. like I have so many friends that like are like I'm I'm I have a bunch of like sync licensing stuff that I do with p different people, and like it's a hit or miss world because you don't know if anyone's actually gonna license any of the stuff you put out. <laughs> yeah, for sure, but. <laughs> It's the kind of thing where it's like the more at bats you increase your chances. And also you have no idea over the course of your lifetime what that stuff is going to do. And I I have yeah. cues that I made like seven years ago when I was first getting like into recording at home and my drum sounds were horrible. Dude, they're, yeah. so, they're so bad. And those cues still make me money every month. Yeah. And it's like, no, the first month that it happened when it was like $27 it brought in, I was not like, wow, that was a that was seven hours well worth it. But now seven years removed and I'm still getting like money from it purely passively. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, well, that was, this is a pretty good way to spend seven hours, honestly. So yeah, for sure. I feel like some musicians sometimes, you know, have a hard time when so much of your trade is like you're in a physical location getting paid for the time you're spending doing that thing, it can be hard to believe that there's another way to do it. But the first time I sold an online course, it was when we were moving into this house and I was getting like PayPal notifications of like people buying the course as I was like moving in. So it was a day where I was yeah. like busy moving, could not like air quotes work at all. And I was like making money and I was like, well, this is this is the craziest thing that's ever happened. Yeah, You know, as someone who's only been paid to like get on a bus and go somewhere, I, it was like mind blowing to me. And I just think there's a lot of opportunity out there for stuff like that. If you're willing to like be creative and quite honestly, put some stuff out that sounds terrible until it sounds good or looks terrible until it looks good or yeah. is awkward on camera until it's not awkward on camera. I mean, I'm having that experience with this podcast right now where finally there are listeners every day. Yeah. It comes out once every two weeks. And obviously, like some people are seeing the new episode, but like previous episodes are just getting listens yeah. out of nowhere now. And it's like, okay, that's a little bit of self sustaining. Yes. Yeah. But also to what you were talking about in terms of the music school method of, you know, you play on the road, you play in the studio, you teach, and that's pretty much all there is. There are a lot of jobs out there that people that are driven to just play their instrument don't realize our jobs. And I know you're saying that, but I'm thinking about like in the realm of like transcriptioning, like I made it my goal when I was at Berkeley to get good at finale. Yeah. Like they gave it to us for free. Yeah. Well, when I turn something in, I don't want it to look bad. Yeah. <laughs> like as someone who was a good music reader, it was just like it mattered to me what things I was turning in looked like, especially if someone else had to play them. Totally. You know, if I was doing things that were for project bands or whatever, where, you know, we had these bands, they were mostly made up of scholarship students. That was kind of how they like justified their scholarships, where it would be like there would be a band in this room and they would rotate them. They were like a whole bunch of them. They'd just be there for two hours and people that were in arranging classes or whatever could bring in charts and just have them read down. Yeah, so sick. And you probably get two or three takes and like, well, the, a surefire way to make sure that that band sounds like shit 
and doesn't do a good job of giving me what I want is to give them bad charts. Yeah, yeah of, course. So, <laughs> of course it is. That's a fail- foolproof way. At our age now, we know that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. College students don't understand that, and then they don't understand why it just doesn't sound good. Well, now I have all these finale skills. <laughs> so, like, let me start doing a whole bunch of church charts yeah. and stuff like that, which yeah. is crazy. I don't do much of that anymore at all. But it was just like for a while when I first moved to town, most of my time was spent in finale (laughs) making money, you know, while I was trying to find stuff. And dude, and sometimes it takes a season of like not having a bunch of work for you to get a little creative and go like, wait a second, churches need sheet music. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I know several people that play at churches. I know a bunch of big churches. I, I can I can go on websites and I mean, the. So when I was coming off the road from touring full time, I'd I'd only ever toured full time. There was like nothing else I had done. So it was like a scary premise. But like, I just knew that touring until I was like 65 and then trying to figure out what happens after that was not looking that sexy to me. Yeah, Uh, no. (laughs) So... I, I, one of the first things I did was like, man, I always have these transcriptions I'm doing. Like, why don't I just email every fucking educational website that I can think of that has drum music and just pray that one of them will like say like, sure. Yeah, we could use help with this. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of, you know, a lot of them looked bad. I also like, there were a bunch of, this was like early days of Instagram and there are a couple of drummers that like had huge followings that were putting out sheet music. And I was like, their sheet music looks terrible too. Like, I'll just reach out to all of these people that are already doing sheet music and be like, hey, I'll bet you you're doing this and you hate it. And that's yeah. part of the reason it looks bad. And you should just have me do it. You know, that led to I just like, you know, this huge part of how I make a living now. Um, and it was just out of like cold email. I mean, I literally probably sent like 200 emails to people. And... There were like, you, you know, there were probably like 40 just immediate, like, don't care. Uh, this is nothing. Yeah, sure. I have no idea why you emailed us. Yeah. And then there was like, you know, 150, just no one responded. And then they were like a couple that were like, okay, cool. We'll put your name on file, which means no. <laughs> yeah. <right>. Um, <laughs> but then there was one person who was like, yeah, actually, I do this right now and I hate it. And I would yeah. love to never do it again. So let's try it out for a little bit and then we'll see what happens. And I, I've i been doing the sheet music for him for, you know, eight years now or whatever it is, seven years now, whatever it is. And, you know, I then started doing stuff on his website, teaching some video lessons for him, like helping him like video edit. And that's how I started to learn how to video edit. He essentially paid me to learn how to video edit. Um because it was the classic thing where he was like, you can edit video, right? And I was like, I have definitely edited video before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I then, understand the concept, but... <laughs> yeah, and it's the like, same thing when like someone was like, you know, I was putting out educational videos on YouTube or whatever, and I had a buddy that reached out and was like, hey, so you record at home, right? Can you do drums on a song? And I was like, definitely, definitely yep. could do that. And then like after like 12 revisions of him being like, yeah, I mean, like, could you redo blah, blah, blah? And could you, blah, and you know how samples work? Could you layer a sample? What? And I was like, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I got, yeah, I got all that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I find that like, sometimes I find, um, this is really just like people in life in general. Like, I'm just really thankful. I had a father that like, he, he's a big DIYer. He's just like, doesn't hire people to do anything. Um, that's less true now that he's old, but, um, now I just help him do everything, but he just very much has like, you know, I don't know what he was doing before Reddit and YouTube, but now he just like gets on Reddit and YouTube and like looks up whatever. And now I text him and ask him questions and then he does that. And then I also do it and we come together and we like figure out, but it's like so much of this stuff is like out there and there really aren't rules. And, um, so many DIY projects are are not any different than like making a living as a musician. It's all just kind of like out there and you can kind of make it up. Um, and the more creative you can be about it, I think the more beneficial it can be for you. And I just find that there's a lot of people that like 
see that like, man, this, this month is kind of a little slow. So they'll just do like one post on Instagram about like, hey, I'm home for the month. Like anybody wants some lessons or whatever. And it's like, I get it. It's a slow yeah. month. You want to fill it out some other way. It's probably going to take a little bit more than that. And it might have to be a little more creative than like you randomly choosing that like this random month out of the last three years is the one where like you're going to do some teaching now, you know? Like, yeah, right. you just kind of got to zoom out a little bit. Like, even if I even if I think you're a great bass player, if I've never seen you teach a bass lesson ever, I don't I'm not super motivated to be like, well, sure. Yeah, yeah let's let's do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. The only people that ever seem to make that kind of thing work are people who play in notable bands totally. with a following totally. who are into that thing. And then you say, you know, because I do watch that happen often enough where it'll be like. I'm going to do 15 lessons this month or whatever, and you're going to get... Well, I, I have two thoughts specifically about that. One, I think already, if they literally phrase it, I have 15 slots available. They've already done a bigger step in marketing than the person that just posts like, I'm bored this month. Can you give me some lessons? Like sign up for a lesson. Yeah, that's scarcity. That's scarcity is one of the best marketing tactics you could ever use. And like whether they know yeah. it or not, that's a brilliant idea. But two... I think there's a lot of people that do that, that just like fake that people sign up for slots and they don't. Yeah, fair. I've seen my, I, like, it's it's interesting because of the transcription thing. Like, it's rare that like drummers work with drummers because sure. a session generally needs one drummer. <laughs> yep. Same with bass players. Yeah. A, a the amount of great bass players who I am familiar with, but if I see them once every two years, it's a lot, is totally a thing. And it's just because... Why would we really be in the same room? Yeah. Yeah. There's the the classic thing is like you you like you and some other bass player, like me and some other drummer finally meet each other. And like some musician that is mutual between the three of us is like, you guys don't know each other. How do you not know each other? And I'm like, yeah. the reason you know us is because you have played gigs with us. There's only one yeah, drummer. Right. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've just like with the transcription thing, I work with a ton of drummers. And a ton of drummers that have like millions of subscribers on YouTube and, you know, huge membership websites. And like when you see behind the scenes of some of that, you start to realize like the the numbers of social media and all of that stuff are not converting into money unless the person who's operating the thing is actually like really business savvy. Yeah, for sure. I just think it's really interesting because there's a lot of people that see like, you know, big Instagram numbers or big YouTube numbers and they're like, oh, that person's rich. And it's like, well, if you really think about it, like most of the videos they post that are doing the best are drum covers. They can't monetize those because, yeah. you know, AdSense gets taken out for whoever holds a copyright for it. So yeah, most of their huge YouTube channel is AdSense that goes to someone else. Yeah, for sure. So unless they have huge brand deals or unless they're, you know, they have some product they sell on some website or something, they, they're they probably not making that much money. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. I mean, and those, that's a great specific example, a very good modern example. Yes, <laughs> but very modern. Um, yeah, like, that's just not something that, you know, players in the 80s had to deal with in the same way. <laughs> no. Unless you were doing, uh, have you seen all those like old transcription books where it'll be a transcription of a part from a track, but they call it something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that thing's so goofy. Yeah. Yeah. But I get but it. But I mean, the older you get with that kind of thing, the goofier. Yeah. Which, by the way, no, no, no shade to people who have like big YouTube channels and like do cover no, videos. Absolutely. It's just like, there's a, I think there's a false like equivalence of like big YouTube channel means lots of money. And it's like, the economics of it are more complicated than that. It's easy to grow a YouTube channel with cover videos, but again, the tempting thing, yeah, it's tempting to do that, but it's hard to convert that into just like, well, all I want to do is like have a YouTube channel. It's hard to do if all you do is covers. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, that opens up an entirely different discussion about like who is trying to look at you for what numbers and what do they know about that? And how does that convert? You know, I mean, like it may not convert into money, but it may convert into opportunity. But the further along we get into the into that modern world, the worse it is for everybody knowing the game of algorithms and numbers and, you know, asking for more things and stuff like the amount of artists that I know and work with at low levels who are 
you know, coming through and talking about the advanced metrics that their managers want, you know, yeah, or know right. to be able to pitch it to someone that's like trying to book them or trying to do maybe like a like a small like one EP deal. You get this many you know, streams on a song, but your monthly listeners are down. And so like that person is caring more about monthly listeners. And, you know, it's no different than the way Instagram is like sort of a moving target of what's hot in the algorithm. Right. Yeah, now. totally. It always is like different things that went from like likes to follows to. And I mean, this isn't I'm not being actually, you know, literal or specific about the progression, but things like, OK, saves versus yeah, sure, you know, sure, like sure. what's the length of interaction like it's always developing which thing is going to be the hot thing that means that you're actually doing something yeah do you think that some of that comes from people getting savvy about like what actually moves that needle i mean the this the social media of it all is is complicated because i think there's like a couple approaches you can take with social media uh one is just chase the algorithm. <laughs> just right, copy yeah. what everyone else is doing, try to do it like the most successful ones and like do it long enough until it starts to catch fire and you're great. And certainly people are doing that to great success. Uh, a lot of people are also doing it to terrible success. <laughs> and by terrible yeah, success, right. I mean no success. Um, yeah. My thing with it has always been like, I don't know. I think there's a middle ground of like, I have a TikTok. I have an Instagram. I got a YouTube. Yeah. I post the same thing to Instagram as I do TikTok. Is that the correct approach for TikTok? No, not really. It's not even really the correct yeah. approach to Instagram anymore. But right. I would have zero TikTok followers if I was only going to, air quotes, play the TikTok game. Uh, I'm not. Right. I'm interested in trying things out. Like, I think it's kind of interesting now that I can film a, I can just talk like, this is what's crazy. And this is why I think like, yes, the algorithm, algorithm chasing is like kind of exhausting. But I think like my approach to it has always just been post things that you find interesting. And I promise other people will find it interesting as well. Yeah. They don't have to be educational if you don't want them to be. They don't have to be like post what you want to post. It will attract other people if it's coming from some place of either I want to provide, you just want to provide value for people, whether that's like entertainment or a joke yeah. or actual educational stuff, whatever it is, um, just do it and try different yeah. stuff. I think a lot of people get stuck in this like, um, I'm not going to post it, but it's, if it's not going to go well or whatever. And it's like, dude, some of the videos that I've tried the hardest to make like, perfect and i'm like this is this is this is going to be great like this is the right search words and the title and the th like all blah i've spent so much time in that and the video will just do like nothing yeah and then i'll make a random video where i'm like i don't know this has been bothering me for a long time i think people think about this the wrong way i'm going to make this video and then that'll be one of the most successful videos that i make and so i, I think algorithm chasing is not something that's like for me is sustainable because it's just so yeah. soul crushing because you live yeah, and die by like every time they change it, you got to learn the new rules. Every time a video you spend a bunch of time, if you're only making the content to chase the algorithm, if it doesn't work, then it crushes you twice the amount that it yeah. would, you know? Um, at this point, if I post a video and it doesn't go, I'm just like, well, that sucks, but I really like the video. So, <laughs> yeah, and it's there, and people that will like it will like yes. it. Where do you fall on the uh, on the scale of like genuineness of content? Yeah, um, which I say because like that is the end of the spectrum that I naturally fall on. For instance, I was talking with a video editor about a week or so ago, and not about for the podcast, but like we were just talking about things, and he was saying like how he hates doing color correction on videos. He was like, if I could get rid of that one thing, if I could get someone to do that, it would be the thing I would hire somebody for first and i said something about like i would get someone to go through and take out all the plosives in the podcast sure. like first just like something that i just don't care about and is annoying like i'll do the i'll do all of the uh all of the content editing and then sound editing can be somebody else's job but it occurred to me that 
I would actually probably have someone do social media for me before I ever considered having yeah. someone else do that. And it's just because that's not where I fall. And it's just been interesting. Like today, the reel that I put out for the previous episode was the first time I was like, you know, I should have captions on here. Yeah, definitely should. Every time something like that happens, I realize it's obvious. And the idea of doing reels in the first place is something that I was like, oh, I should be doing that in between episodes. If there's going to be two weeks between episodes doing a few reels, like especially because reels are an algorithm mover. A hundred percent. I'm also okay with figuring those things out as I go. Yeah. Because first and foremost to me is like the content of the episode. Yeah. And I know that it's hard, especially like as saturation of the podcast market happens. Here's the thing. I, I get so bummed out when people talk about like the saturation of stuff. Not that... I mean, you have a podcast, which means you are not yeah. one of those people. Because it's like, right. yeah, everyone has a podcast, but they don't. Also, everyone right. has a YouTube channel, but they don't. If you if you text like the last 15 people you texted in your phone right now, I bet you all 15 of them do not have a podcast. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this is like, it's it's also like Nashville's not short on musicians, but a bunch of my friends signed up to do that. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, for sure. Don't don't be selective with what you think you add value to. Like if you think you're a valuable musician, then you probably have some cool stuff to say. Or maybe you're just like great at like ranting and talking shit. People love that. Yeah, That's also sure. like, you know what I mean? I wish there were more like uh, <laughs> there are definitely times where I want to be, but I wish there were more like musician podcasts that were just like I'm going to tell all my secrets and I'm going to just burn it down like that would be amazing <laughs> we need that yeah um but yeah i mean like with the genuine thing and with the hiring out social media and stuff like i think like you know people have to do what works but my thing with social media in general is like it's all a long-term investment in like keeping me on people's minds and that's like tiktok and instagram is me just reminding people like hey by the way i exist isn't that nice yeah sure <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> that's like kind of the the way those platforms exist. Like, they're not platforms where like you're gonna go to Instagram and be like, I need to learn how to whatever. So like for me, Instagram and TikTok are ways to like keep myself on people's mind, which that that's huge value. Even if I hate social media, which I do. Yeah, I mean, same. That's hugely valuable. That like if you and I don't talk for a year and a half you've been seeing my face for a year and a half. And it's a hell of a lot easier for me to post an Instagram video than it is to go to a fucking show and hope that you'll be there. So <laughs> yeah. um, that's one of the things. But the other thing is like, I used Instagram as like a, okay, if recording it, if like recording drums and video editing are valuable skills in the world now, why don't I use Instagram to work on them? So it's like funny, yeah. like my Instagram is full of videos that like people don't necessarily ever hire me to like do mo most of the things I put on Instagram, but I'm doing yeah. them because I'm like, I think this is interesting. I really want to try to get a drum sound that's like this record or like that record or whatever. So let me yeah. like find this little track or like do this little duet with this person and try to make that happen. That's like a good little exercise that to me is more valuable than me like yeah. continuing to just work on paradiddles or whatever the hell. I would be doing yeah. if, you know, and so that's my view of like TikTok and Instagram is like, it's a way f to like kind of force myself into these little exercises. Um, but with YouTube, it's a long-term investment. YouTube is a search engine, man. Yeah, absolutely. And even if your video only has 200 views for the first three years, you never know. I posted a video again. I post the stuff that I feel like passionate about for the most part. And that's, typically the stuff that ends up doing the best and it's impossible to predict how uh, uh, we're episode 007 right now uh, I posted wow. a video a while ago I think last year it was um, uh, a whole a whole video just about like the sound in the GoldenEye soundtrack that sounds like it's it's like a, a weird reverby metal metallic sound thing. I just always loved it. it if I played yeah. it for you right now, you'd be like, oh yeah, it's that sound. Um, uh -huh. I was just always like, what the hell is this sound? So I went on this quest to like figure it out, made a YouTube video about it, tried to recreate it. And the video came out and I was like, I even the thumbnail, I knew that I wasn't quite, 
doing what YouTube says I should do, but I edited my face on a Pierce, Bro- Pierce Brosnan and it was, it was just the best. <laughs> so I like, it came out, I was really proud of the video. I really liked the thumbnail. I thought it was funny. And it sat at like 300 views for a year. And I was like, well, yeah. that All right. <laughs> was not worth the effort objectively, but I had a hell of a good time doing it. All of a sudden that video has been taken off. And it's like, it's at like 4,000 views now or something. And it's like, no, that's yeah. still not nearly the most viewed video on my channel. But 4,000 people is a ton of people. And there's, if, you, if you're watching that video and going to another video of mine, you're entering my world on my terms in, in such like that you're really seeing the real me. And if you're going to watch another video, it means like you're actually there for me. You're not there for some like algorithm game I was playing that month. And now that you're watching a video from three years ago, you're like, what the hell is this? Who is this guy? This is not. So I feel like if you're just putting yourself out there and it's attracting people like that, that will be worth it in the long run. If you can then convert them to whatever your thing is. If your thing is playing on people's records, great. If your thing is like selling them some PDF about whatever, great. If your thing is like a course on whatever, great. Like, um, and YouTube's been amazing. Like YouTube, my numbers are still like not that high as far as subscribership, but I have an email list built off of it and I sell to my email list and it's great. And yeah, for sure. It's a huge portion of what I make every year. And again, it's like numbers aren't always what you think. Like there are people I know that have full-time YouTube careers that aren't making that much off of their YouTube channel alone, but they found other ways to monetize it. And it's like similar for me. It's like, yeah, if you look at my YouTube numbers, it's like, eh, it's not, eh, it's fine. But it's what you can convert that into and it's what you do with what you have. And it's like, I feel like people just get really like, in a world where like everything anyone posts has like metrics that everyone can see. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't let that discourage you. Like it doesn't really take that many people to potentially change your life. And and again, it goes back to like how many people would it take paying you $50 a month to like never have to play one of those terrible gigs that you take just because you hate it, but you need the money. Like, that's the kind of thing I think more people could think about is like, it doesn't have to be $15,000 a month. <laughs> no, absolutely not. It's That's what I was about to I was thinking to, that I was going to say when you were finished is like, I don't think enough people do this. And some of it is probably, you know, whatever you want to say about pace of our world and whatever. But I don't think enough people sit back and think about like, what do I need? What do I have? What do I have to get to? It's a trite kind of joke, but like, you know, I'm super lucky now to have like a wife that has a kick ass business. Totally. You know? And so like to think to myself, yeah, I, you know, am still interested in going on the road, but like I don't need 150 dates anymore. Yeah. I mean, not that anyone like that's our age now, you know, wants to be working 150 dates. Sure you know, to feel good, like, you know, like shows it, you know, everyone, everyone wants that 70 show a year gig. That's like the right amount of time and everything. But it's just like, I don't need to, I don't need to do that to be okay. Yeah. You know, and especially to be like, oh, what dollar amount do I have to be at? I will say this is something with music. No, I think it is actually just people in general. There are all kinds of people that are at some job, whether it's music or somewhere else where like they're, working for a certain amount of money and more is asked of them and they feel bad about asking for more money or feel bad about asking for a certain amount of money. And it's like, no, like you should have an idea of like what you're worth. Yeah. And you should found it in reality, hopefully. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Cause I've, you know, I've also had the opposite end of the spectrum where like musicians I know have like nothing going on in a month. I'll try to get them on a session and they'll be like, it's 500 an hour. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? Yeah. You, you're not doing anything this month. What are you talking about? Yeah. And it's just cause they thought it was at like a fancy studio. They thought the artist was like going to be some major label, yeah, whatever. Right. It's like, you didn't, yeah. you, you messed this one up, man. <laughs> you didn't play the cards <laughs> right on this one. Um, yeah. 
honestly, I am happy to admit that my biggest character flaw as a musician is when the question comes like, what's your rate? And I always go, fuck. <laughs> because I don't have like rates like that, you know? Like I'm like I still exist in a world where I'm happy to work. Yeah. You know, and have enough work that it's just like I feel great about doing this. Yeah. And I don't need to like be that way, even in like an ebb period. Right. I yeah, and I think that like even stuff like that, like that's something that like not enough people talk about is like I remember I did a master class at Belmont, um, and one of the kids asked, like, what did you get paid on your last tour? And I was just like, one, that's like kind of a tacky question. But yeah. But two, you're actually asking the wrong question because one, you as like a freshman at Belmont have like never played a show. So like me yeah. having been removed from like where you're at a decade plus, hopefully I'm in a position where whatever gig I'm on is not the kind of gig you're going to be getting. So whatever I got paid is irrelevant anyway. That's like kind of asking a CEO yeah. As you're entering the field of like whatever tech job you're going into, asking some CEO like, hey, like, what'd you get paid last year? And then going into your first negotiation when you get a job offer and being like, well, <laughs> yeah. I heard 2.7 mil is like the going rate. It's like, well, no. Um, no, not to mention that you saying whatever number evokes a different, you know, brain response to the college kid and to you. Totally. You know, if you say, you know, like, let's just say 750 is you say the show pay on my last tour was 750 a show. Yeah. Even if you think that is good, it triggers just a different. Yeah. Continuing pattern of thought for you and for them by answering it quite that way. Well, and it also means nothing for them because what are the chances that you're going to graduate and then immediately start playing for someone that's like going to put you on retainer or whatever? Like, I'm not saying it doesn't yeah. happen, but I am saying it's not entirely super likely right <laughs> the better question would be like how should i price myself how should i figure out how much to charge because yeah. that was the thing like i you know i graduated and was like hey what should i charge for shows and i asked people that were a little ahead of me and they were like well you know you should expect or charge blah 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 and it's like okay great and then i just did it and i never yeah. thought about the fact that like well playing a show in la that's a one-off but you know, there's two travel days on either side or whatever is entirely different than playing th four hours away in like Georgia or whatever and coming back yeah. the same night. These are not the same right. situation at all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying that like every gig will let you be flexible with those things, but it's like, it's just basic like logic. Sometimes you have to apply and go like, well, okay, what is my time worth? Like, why would I charge any of this amount of money? And like you were saying, like, how much money do you need a year or a month? Yeah. And then how fi figure out how much you need a month, figure out how much you need a week, figure how much you need. If you, if you average three gigs a week or whatever, one of them in town, two of them on the road or whatever, figure out how much you need. And that should be your like, you know, goal. But for me, I feel like something that's been helpful is like, there's totally ways that you can like ratchet the number up or down depending on what makes sense. Like you're saying, sometimes you just like a gig. It's like, well, I'll do it for yeah. free. Like I have certain producers yeah, right. that when they're like, hey, can you play on this thing? I'm like, yeah. They're like, man, I only got like, you know, some low ball number. I'm like, I don't care. They never want revisions. Their stuff always sounds good. Yep. They're so easy to work with. And I like recording drums. Great. And there are other clients... <laughs> <laughs> that'll be yeah. like, I have this song and I'm like, well, I know, I know that yeah. this is going to be like 27 emails, no matter what I do. This is going to be 27 emails back and forth. It's going to be like four revisions, whatever. So uh, the same rules do not apply. And I feel like that is something that, you know, you kind of just have to pick your goal number. And then like, in the same way that like with a, with a normal job, they go, this is your salary. These are your benefits more salary with no benefits is very different than lesser salary, great benefits or kind of less salary, but terrible benefits. You know what I mean? Like these are things that you weigh in the world where people get paid money to do things. And it's like as musicians, it's the same thing. Oh, we're not driving anywhere. It's a fly day. Like it's only one travel day. It's an okay show pay, but I love the music and I love the people or whatever. Like, yeah, I might yeah. say yes to that. I remember probably three, four years after I moved to Nashville. And I was uh, talking with my friend, David Labriere, who was a 
childhood hero of mine because he played bass for John Mayer for like 10 years. And so like I grew up ripping him off. <laughs> You know, it's no different than like, you know, being able to get source material for things like or like being an archaeologist, right. <laughs> like finding <laughs> like the source material. That's exactly what it was kind of like. Yeah. But, you know, he was the first person to ever teach me about music gigs versus business gigs and how like they are often not the same. Yeah. You know, like the gigs that make money and the gigs that are good for music are yeah. often not the same gig when you find one. If it is positive to your life and mental health, like don't ever let it go. Yeah. But you have to do these to pay for this. Yeah. And it sort of hits the same nerve for me as talking about like, yeah, there are people that I will move my schedule immensely yeah. if they want a track from me, yeah. you know, the same day or whatever. There is like great value in that. And it's about what you value. Man, yeah. And in so, so many one ways. of the things that like, I think back to like how we started all this with like talking about diversifying or whatever, I do have like a lot of things going on. And what that's allowed me to do is like the more kinds of things you do, lessons, courses, transcriptions, sessions, live playing, whatever, in all of them, you can kind of start to like be a little more selective and go like, well, okay, sure. Yeah. I don't have any like live work coming up on the schedule, but I have all these other things. Yeah. And that way a live thing does come around and it doesn't pay great, but the people are great and the music's great. You go like, fuck yeah, let's do it. Yeah, Cause I actually, absolutely. I don't need this to feed myself because I have all this other stuff going on. This is just going to be so fun. Yeah. And then you go do it. And like, it's been really cool for me. The more I have, gathered other ways that I do drum things in the world. Like I've played some shows and like, it's just fun to like play shows now. It like w won back yeah. some of the like enjoyment in music for me by not. Well, you changed the stakes. Yes. Of totally. the gig, you know, because that's yes. another thing too, is like the thing you're talking about isn't necessarily a situation where if, you needed that money to make rent or whatever Correct. that you'd be like staking like your well-being on this gig right. like that probably wouldn't be the same gig as like oh we're gonna like me and these musicians who i'm friendly with and i know we're all badass we're gonna go make great music yeah you know like those are probably not gonna be the same thing where like correct yeah you know, on on monday you know you could feel that way but something happens on wednesday and now all of a sudden friday you're like well shit like i I'm depending on right. those are probably not going to be the same thing, but you have changed the stakes of what, yeah. you know, requirement of a gig comes out yeah. of. I feel like when I was only touring, the thing that I was constantly caught in is like, um, you're just kind of on this like hamster wheel of like, there's no job security at all. Because even if you're on a great gig, like they can get pregnant, they can go to record an album, they can do, they can want to start a career in acting. Like there's all kinds of ways that they can just be like, yeah. oh yeah, by the way, like next month, like I'm just never going to play a show ever again. And you yep. go from having like an incredible gig to literally no work. That was always terrifying. But it's also the kind of thing where like, uh, you're all, I was always just feeling like all of my self-worth was tied to the way that gig was perceived. And yeah, it, it was like a real life version of what I think a lot of people experience on Instagram. <laughs> um, yeah, for you sure. You know what I mean? Like everybody's doing that on Instagram. They're looking at people's like vacations in Italy or whatever. And they're like, God damn it. My life isn't as good as theirs. Um, yeah. But I felt like only touring. That was just that. That just like was my life. I was like getting out of the bus and I'd feel great if like we were the headliner at like, you know, with like, two other artists opening for us and whatever. But then we go to a festival and I'd be like, well, shit, like we're not on main stage this year. We're on the set. Like that, that was just like never ending for me. And I felt yeah, like sure. it was just like really soul crushing. And now I go to some festival and because that isn't the only thing I'm doing, I'm just able to go and be like, oh man, my friend is playing main stage, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm hopefully I'm going to see some of their set and like, I'll definitely like try to get together at catering and fuck around and hang out with them. Cause that'll be great. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like it can just be really brutal. And that, you know, a lot of that is like my own baggage. It's not like, uh, 
anyone was making me do that. Yeah. But um, yeah. I think that's really common for people. And I think like, I think maybe one of the underlying like psychological things that's going on there is like, well, hey, like this is your life's work. Like if all you're going to do is tour at the end of your life, like who'd you tour with? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, that's like kind of a scary question because like even if you tour with someone who's like some great artist that like everyone that you run into you can be like oh i tour with so and so they'll be like oh my god that's amazing um one that's only going to be the reaction for like five years (laughs) yeah (laughs) unless you play with you know a beetle or someone else you know what i mean like all of that is like so short-sighted and whatever but i feel like but touring and live work was just so like there's there's nothing like I I never felt like I was walking away really truly like investing in anything other than just like I'm getting this paycheck and I'm getting out of here. I'm here to serve their music. I'm here to like sure. not be a pain in the ass for like whoever else is out here. But like, and I you know I felt like I I was as artistic as I could be with the like the restraints I was given on every gig I've ever been yeah. on. But like. Uh-huh. It's just so different now because I have so many other ways that I contribute to the world where I go like, well, whether you like it or not, this is me and it's out there now. So you can go buy it or you can go watch it or you can go stream it or whatever. That like it took the pressure off of like live gigs needing to like define who I am because I now have like all this other stuff I do that's like a body of work where I can say like, oh man, I'm going to die tomorrow. But like, People will still be, you know, I've made all kinds of videos on my YouTube channel of like, and all kinds of podcast episodes about like stuff that is either like, I think really helpful. And I've heard from people is really helpful or some of it just like means a lot to me. And I'm like, I don't fucking care what people think about it. Like I'm, I want to say this and I said it and that just feels really good and takes the pressure off of live environment to like have to do that for me. Yeah. And that's what we're all looking for right it's like taking pressure off (laughs) at the end of the day it's like such a high pressure world and stuff and everything causes pressure and there's always new pressure i mean life really is like seasons of tv where like at the end of a season of a tv show it might wrap up there might either be a cliffhanger or it might wrap up if there's a cliffhanger you know there's going to be a new status quo when it comes back around yeah or if it wraps up, you know, something's going to get fucked up right. when it comes back on the air. You know, yeah. like life really is kind of that way. There is only so much like levity. Yeah. And in a world where it all contributes to each other, it's hard to do music and think about life. Yeah. You know, when life is heavy. Yeah. It is hard to like be unencumbered. I have reached a point where it is pretty easy to think to myself, well, I'm worried about this thing. But it's going to be there when I get off stage. So, like, let me bookend yeah. being on stage by just not caring about that yeah. for a little while. Yeah. And, it, you know, it doesn't always work, but it has been much better about that. And for sure. You're just trying to alleviate that bit, that bit of pressure. I, the last thing I'll say about that is, like, I feel like one of the big things that I learned is, like, because, like, toward the end of me, like, doing full-time live stuff, I was road managing and tour managing yeah. And the big, like, the the practical thing I could say to people about this is, like, I realized, like, playing live, I was essentially managing someone else's business. Right. Yet I had no, I was given no stakes in it. Like, I was not a shareholder in the business. It was just like, no, 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 I yep. just want you to make my business as good as possible. But I have no allegiance to you. <laughs> I can fire yeah. you or quit at any moment. And they did. <laughs> they did quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just stopped being a artist altogether. Um. Yep. I just realized like, wait a second, I don't have to do that. I could have my own business if I took the chance and believed in myself enough. And at the very least, at the end of it, I'll be quitting on my own terms or I'll leave behind all this stuff that like I did. And that's where I feel like on, on a positive note, I realized like it might be worth it to figure out how to edit fucking video because maybe I'll be able to like not have to worry that like tomorrow this job won't exist (laughs) yeah absolutely and i think that wrapping up this discussion about diversification of you know your own self-business is uh diversifying but also having some things that are for you yeah outside of some really crazy circumstances if you're only dependent on other people 
those things can all go away. Yeah. And in the worst book of Job kinds of scenario, yeah. they could all go away at once on the same day if they all really lined up that way. But if there's some stuff that is for you, obviously you are the person that has to keep it going, but at least it can't drop out from under you the yeah. same way if it is yours. And so that's good. My therapist said, because I have, I have a lot of anxiety, and my therapist at some point, um, I have a lot of anxiety about things that I can't control. Um, you and my wife should meet. Yeah. <laughs> when I first started going to therapy, uh, I was just having a lot of anxiety about a lot of things. And my therapist said like, I mean, hey, you have like all this like music stuff that you do that no one in your family ever experienced. Like your parents didn't know how to help you with it. Like your dad, you get a lot of advice from him. He had no idea how to tell you how to make this happen. A lot of the musicians you know, like chose like very different paths than you, but like you figured it out. So why would you believe in yourself enough to do all that, but not believe in yourself to like figure out this like pretty random thing that you're like feeling a lot of anxiety about? And it was like this whole moment of like, wow, that's like kind of, yeah, I had never thought of it like that. It's like, yeah, I do definitely never doubt that I'll figure out like, uh, how to, you know, get more clients in the session world or whatever. Like, I've never doubted that, like, I think if I try hard enough, I think I'll figure that out. That's never been a doubt for me, but I do doubt that I can, like, never, ever overcome certain anxieties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. And it's to encourage people out there, like, I don't know, you likely have figured out how to, like, work through some very difficult thing and you probably believed you could do it. And although it was a little uncomfortable or scary, uh, you did it. And you probably could do that with making a podcast or making a YouTube channel or finally publishing a book or whatever. Like, you can do it. <laughs> it's definitely all doable. Uh, for all that business talk, uh, I definitely want to reset um, for a second and talk uh, about you as a drummer. Okay. And mostly just from the, the standpoint of being like, I think we've played, if we've played half a dozen actual gigs together, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. Uh, yeah. It is crazy because it's definitely been what's, it's 2024. Yeah. We've known each other for over a decade yeah. at this point. But what's crazy is, and I think some of it, we were talking about being young and just doing shit and stuff like that, that, uh, we met on a gig mm -hmm. that was going to be a situation of just like driving in a car to Ohio. Oh yeah. You know, and using a bunch of backline gear. And from then on, it has sort of been a matter of except for like a brief period where I was just working with the same drummer a lot. And so it would just be like, Oh hey, you want to come do this one too? Or this thing yeah. too? And like I recall a point in which he and I played for four different artists in the same week. Yeah. You know, or whatever. But other than that, like, if I am in a position to think about drummers to, like, come on to things, I am always thinking about you. Mm. I think the reason that that is such a thing is, like, I think the way that you sort of, not to use the word eclectic badly in a <laughs> very Sister Act 2 kind of way, but to say, like, you know, that uh, when people watch videos that you're posting on Instagram of drumming and things like that, it's clear that you have an openness to, you know, the different kinds of sounds that you can get out of the same drum mm. and things like that. And I think that that also is you, you know, I watch you on Instagram all the time talk about, you know, music that is, you know, made with not real drums or mm -hmm. not even a drum, a physical drum to be found mm -hmm. miles away from the session. And that it is so much more of an ethos. And you manage to capture that ethos across, you know, everything that you do with drumming. Mm. You know, I haven't ever really watched, you know, seen you do anything personally. I'm sure there are things out there of you doing like drum programming. Mm -hmm. You know, everything I see you is actually behind a kit yeah. and stuff. But just that idea that all of that is valid to you, you know, it all informs the same, yeah. the same major thing. How did you kind of develop that? Well, I'm sure it's it's probably mostly subconscious. Um. Well, one, that's like uh, really nice. A lot of what you just said is very huh. kind. Yeah. Uh, and I don't say that as a joke. I like really 
mean that. Um, I mean, it's true. <laughs> and yeah, it's interesting. You're actually like not the first person recently to be like, yeah, you just get a lot of sounds out of one drum. And like, that's a really interesting thing that not just you has noticed and not something that I'm like uh-huh. always conscious of. But when someone says it, I'm like, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess so. Like one of the things I'm pushing against the most is I think we like we've all seen it like with our parents or with like our siblings that are 10 years older than us or whatever like you like listen to music until you're done with like midway through college years ish even if you don't go to college you know like yeah. those years seem to be like you're figuring it out and then like midway through college you figured it out and you stop listening to new music and you just like bump the same records until you die essentially. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Perhaps we could call that the Dave Matthews band syndrome. E- yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which I say which I say as a as a like pretty large Dave Matthews yeah, fan. I, hey, like, listen man. Those people are I, yeah. I had a Carter Beaufort phase. Um like <laughs> and to me the just the thing that blows my mind about that is like there's so much great music out there and there's every step of technology like every new technology thing that happens is like a whole new generation of people that are like making music. Like there's so many musicians I know that are like, no, oh, they're just like making music in a bedroom now. Like, blah, 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 blah. and it's just like, like, yeah, there are a lot of like bad songs where like someone is just like in their bedroom, like recording things very poorly. And like, it doesn't sound good. Sure. Yeah. That's definitely out there. <laughs> Yeah. I, I live in reality. I know that that's out there. The fact that like Billy Eilish and Phineas can like just kind of the two of them in one room, like do what they do is like only possible through like the technology we have now. That's right. And only possible through like both of them having the mindset of like, well, if this is all we've got, what can we do? And, yeah. you know, I just think like, I'm always open to like, like everything has rhythm. You know what I mean? Like the best vocalists yeah. are like the the best instrumentalists of any instrument are always people that are like either drummers or super conscious of drumming. So I love yeah. playing with you. Like when I was listening <laughs> back to the session we did, I was like, man, the this the pocket is incredible. And it's like, yeah, not always the case that I feel like to to go through the world and not be like trying to experience new exciting things um, is crazy. And I think a lot of it comes from like going into something, not looking for like, what do I hate about this? But just listening with a little bit of a broader perspective and like actually just listening for like, what do I like about this? Yeah. Even if. I'll never listen to this record again and I don't like the vocals and whatever. Like a lot of it just has to do with like zooming out a little bit and like trying to find like one or two things where I go like, man, I mean, I honestly think this is a terrible (laughs) recording, but the guitar player is going for it and it's kind of cool. Yeah. I feel that way about songs on gigs too. Totally. If I'm going to have to play this song for the next three years, if I don't like it as a whole, you're talking about zooming out. I'm actually thinking about zooming in a little bit and finding like some anchor point, you know, and be like, well, I can get behind this. Yeah. Thing, and that feels really good. Yeah. A couple things. And I'll circle back to, and what you just said, one is, uh, that is mighty nice of you to say about, uh, my bass playing. But even before you said it about me, I was going to say, um, yeah, sure. You were now in retrospect you were (laughs) well no i was gonna say (laughs) all my shit is drum shit yeah like every fill i play is just drum fills with notes yeah like and that's just how i've always operated because i just i love drums (laughs) in that way like i love thinking about and listening to like rhythm that way and so it's nice that uh you said you see that or hear that without you know, a prompting of me saying something like that. It's, it's, it's so obvious to me. Like there are people that think about rhythm and there are people that don't. Yeah. And, and, and I'm even talking about musicians, which seems like it makes no sense at all, but there are people that are just wholly unaware that 
any of that is going on. In the same way that I'm sure there's a lot of drummers that don't think about harmony or don't think about melody at all. And that's also yeah. a gigantic mistake. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I think singing drummers are often some of the best drummers I ever hear. Hell yeah. I think so much of that has to do with they see the arc of sections or whole songs, you know, differently because they understand that flow more than just in, you know, m beat cells mm -hmm. that way. Another thing I was going to say is that it's funny that you brought up the bedroom producing thing because uh, the last person I had on this show is my buddy Steven, who is uh, who's a mix engineer. He's the one who mixed the music for this yeah, podcast. I listened to the episode. Oh, you did? Yeah. Uh, we talked a whole bunch about that. <laughs> and so uh, and even more that got cut. And so that is an interesting thing. Uh, it's always just funny when like in back to back episodes, the same theme comes up yeah. and I don't necessarily bring it up <laughs> quite that way. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is like you were saying about new technology and stuff. And there's always something to be brought back as well. Like we're seeing that so much now with like things that are what we would now consider old technology yeah. that was like overused because it was new and hip and then it goes away like it gets some taste back and then comes back around and the thing that i think about is you owning roto toms <laughs> you know hell yeah man <laughs> because there is such a a great place for roto toms <laughs> but there wouldn't have been in 1993 if you'd showed up with roto toms to any session in any town in 1993 <laughs> someone would have been really annoyed <laughs> Well, and but so much of it is like how, not exactly what, but how, you know what I mean? Well, no, and it is 100% that, but I, I guess I'm just saying like once you get away from the burnout of something. Yes, totally. You can how something in a different way. Well, I, another thing that I think most musicians would benefit from is just like just being curious. Like maybe maybe you do hate the state of like modern country. Yeah. Okay. Sure, you could totally build a case for that if you want. But like, instead of like focusing your energy on that, like you could focus it on like, how did we get here? Why? And you could yeah. you could very quickly be like, well, it was probably blah, 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 blah. But it's like, it's probably not that simple. Like you really do actually have to like go back and try to like piece it together if you really want to build like a convincing case. And you'll definitely learn yeah. something doing that. And you'll definitely learn that, like, there is a reason. Uh, yeah. And, like, that's, like, entirely more interesting and more helpful to you. And, like, sure, maybe at the end of it, you still, like, don't start throwing on, like, the Spotify top 100 country songs of today or whatever. But yeah. I think more musicians, like, could benefit from just being curious about, like, well, man, like, why... why why is there so much like program drums? Like I hate program drums. I just want them to be like real drums. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I also didn't start playing drums because I just like loved drum machines so much, but right. I love programming drums. I think it's so fun and I'm better at it than a lot of producers because they don't play drums and they have, yeah, that's right. They have all the same samples, but like you're saying, they don't, think about rhythm in the way that I do because they don't play drums. So I yeah. think that like being curious about it and like being like, well, what sounds are going on pop songs right now and why or whatever? Like, I just think that, I don't know, there's a lack of like curiosity from people. People, and, and I think that like music education from all fronts kind of does this to us. But like everything currently is so about like what genre does it go in uh is this a medium lesson or a, a easy lesson or a beginner lesson or an advanced lesson or whatever yeah. um there's so much like categorizing and there's so many genres and there's so much like metrics of this and that and the other thing and like you know and back to your like new york musician people it's like are they an educator or are they a drummer are they a, like what a if if you just like release from all of that and zoom out a little bit and just go like, I'm not a drummer, I'm a musician, but I yeah. specialize in the rhythmic stuff. Why uh -huh. couldn't I program a drum beat that's like awesome? Oh, well, you could. And yeah. I, I don't know. I just find like the lack of curiosity and the like needing to be a drummer, not a producer or needing to be like, I'm not an educator, I'm a this or... That like really holds people. It held me back for a long time 
because I had only toured yeah. and I was scared what people would call me. And now I run into some people and they're like, oh man, I heard you like got a day job. And I'm like, well, I don't like tour as much as I used to, but I like wouldn't yeah. consider it a day job. But I'll like, but I also don't care what you think it is. <laughs> Yeah. I think the thing about education too, like it's not just for musicians either. Like the average person I think has such a better musical enrichment. Totally. When you do that thing where it's like, uh, who's an artist that you like and then find out what artists they like. Yeah. You know, that informed them and maybe you won't like them, but you'll understand yeah. the person you like better. Yeah. And then you can keep following that chain back and end up in some like really crazy places. And there's always something to be mined there. Like yeah. there's not you're not just going to be like, well, that's not. Yeah, I think maybe people's listening habits have also been shaped by like maybe our brains are being shaped by like. I know you've talked about short attention spans before on the podcast. Like, yeah, maybe we are being shaped by like, a, well, if I'm going to be consuming a thing, I have to be getting something from it the whole time that I'm listening to it or yeah. watching it or whatever. Um, and that's like, I, I, I just think that that's a impractical way to go about life, but um, and not <laughs> reflective <would> <laughs> of how life works. But like, I don't know. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's annoying that this song has an intro that's 45 seconds long. Maybe that is a little annoying. But do you like the rest of the song? You know? Because <laughs> the first 45 seconds were only the first 45 seconds. Like, what about the... But we have a hard time, like... I feel like people want to have it be like, I like this song, I don't like this song. Yeah. But really, the whole beauty of life is, like, being able to realize that, like... Well, I don't like parts of this song. The 45 second intro is maybe one of them. Right. But like the drums and the guitar playing is incredible. Like I don't like how they process the vocals and like their vocal tone isn't my favorite either. But like, and it's the same with like any media you consume. Like my wife watches like Grey's Anatomy and a bunch of shows that like I wouldn't typically choose to watch. And when I watch them, I think there's things like that could be argued are objectively not great. Yeah. But there are also things that are objectively like, like literally some of the most perfect version of that thing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, yeah, you could choose to watch the thing and just be like, well, I hate this. And like, this isn't blah, blah, blah. And like Scorsese wouldn't do this or whatever. And it's like that. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think you're correct about that. But also like, what about the fact that of all the like medical procedural things on TV, like this one's lit better than most of them. Do you ever think about that? Because yeah. lighting on a lot of them is fucking terrible and it's pretty good on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just find it like not that interesting to go through life and just be like calling out everything you hate and not realizing that like you're focusing on the 50% of it. And I'm not even a, I'm not a super optimistic person. This isn't coming from like, no. a, yeah, no, not at is, all. This is not coming from like a, like this is maybe even purely out of self-preservation that I had to realize like, and it goes back to some of what you're saying about like being on the road and like playing songs that maybe I don't love. Like you have yeah. to find a way to like that song. Otherwise you'll hate every second of the whole gig. And like my yeah, teacher right. in college one of the greatest things he ever said was he doesn't get paid to have an opinion about a song. And I love that. Yeah. When you're in a session and the goal is we need to record this song and make it as good as we can. Like, it doesn't matter that you think it's no. a bad song and it might be a bad song. <laughs> you might be right, but your being right is just like working against what you're trying to accomplish, which is like, I want to make this as good as I can. I want to put drums on it as good as I can. And to do that, I need to phrase things in a way that is giving everybody a chance to like stay in the most creative and like positive space they can and like whatever. And it's just like bringing to the table like, well, I don't know, I'm just going to like do another take. So like song's not even that good. It's like, that's not fun for yeah. literally anyone. Yeah. Who does that help? And also like, I mean, I don't want to be like a totalitarian about it or say it quite this way, but it's like every great musician that you love has had to eat shit on a gig or a session at some point. Yeah, they've you played know? on all kinds of terrible stuff you've never heard. Yeah, and the best, yeah, exactly. And the best ones, you know, 
there's something dangerous that a dangerous path to go down uh that maybe someone that's not as uh thoughtful as you or i might take away from this but it's like okay how can i make this better and it isn't your job to make the song better like to like just go for it and fix and like fix a bad yeah. song but there i guess what i really mean by saying is like that's a superficial way to think of that but there is a nuanced way to like offer something to it your best contribution to the best thing it can be I, yeah and that's all you're trying to do at the end of the day is like i want this i want these drums to be as good as i can make them and i want everybody in the room the artist who's paying you by the way to be the happiest they can be and i've been in so many sessions where like the producer and the artist are there and like none of the musicians even talk to the artist and it's like i get that the producer is who hired us and that like the producer is the one that like has the technical know-how to like communicate with a band and whatever but like the artist is the it's their song (laughs) Yeah, and they sure. like definitely have opinions about how it should go. Like you're saying, like even if they're, not, it's sometimes it's a huge advantage for them to not be, like, the most musically proficient. Like some of the best, uh, I mean, Rick Rubin's making his whole like book speaking career yeah. about like knowing nothing about music or whatever he's yeah, doing. That's right. Um, we definitely don't have enough time to get into that, but um, <laughs> you know people that aren't trained in music are sometimes the most valuable people to have around um, because they're not consumed about like whether like that note was just the tiniest bit flat or whatever. They're going like, this makes me feel nothing and I should feel sad because it's a sad song. And guess what? (laughs) People listening to it on the radio or at a show, that's all they're thinking is like, I want to rage. I want to have fun and like, you know, let loose and if you're on stage and no one you're you're not doing anything to make them feel that way then like you didn't do a good job and it was way easier than like <laughs> whether you should play this inversion of the chord or this one it's like now nah, you weren't even in the ballpark so that doesn't even move the needle on any of it like <laughs> another person we don't have time to uh deep dive into opinions about but uh, you just made me think of something that you know a long time ago I heard Questlove talk about was something about how he tries his hardest not to think about music as good or bad, but as effective or ineffective. Uh huh. And so much of that comes from like, you know, he makes so much of his money as a Lord. DJ. <laughs> Wait, I love that. It's like, does it do the thing? Like, if it's supposed uh, to be a sad song, does it make you sad? <laughs> and then, yep, it's effective. I love that. Cause there's also like, you know, there's like all kinds of genres that are strange and weird and whatever. And like, sure. At the end of the day, you still might listen to it and go, I would never listen to this on my own. That's fine. Yeah. That that's an entirely different conclusion than this is bad. Like I have this thing where like, I don't like the band queen. That doesn't mean Uh I don't think they're good. They're obviously extraordinary. Yeah. But I'm not personally ever going to put on a record where the vocals are delivered in like the kind of like theatrical way that like Freddie Mercury, the guy from Muse, you know, yeah, like you hate panic theater, at the, so yeah, it's fine. panic at the disco. Like this is just never going to be the kind of voice that I go like, you know what I'm in the mood for this. That doesn't mean that I yeah. don't think they're exceptionally good. And I think there's just so many people that are like approaching things from a, it's either good or bad. And there's an objective answer and I'm the objective answer and it's bad because I don't like it. And it's like, yeah, there's like so many missteps there because it isn't an objective answer first. And secondly, yeah. uh, your opinion usually doesn't matter because you're only one yeah, of right. billions of people on the planet. Yeah, man. Yeah. I just find it so valuable to like, like just pull up Spotify and listen to like five albums you've, you've never listened to before. And just don't try to form an opinion about it. Yeah. Just listen through the five. That makes me think of like uh, the two rules of Questlove's that I have always tried to adopt are that about the good and bad versus effective and ineffective. And the other is to really try hard not to evaluate a record until it's been out for six months. 
I like that. Yeah, which is like, you know, a function of um especially for bigger, heavier promoted records that you the hype just uh-huh. has some influence in there. And then once it's gone Some influence. It's all the influence. Well, yeah, I'm I'm trying to be diplomatic, but you're right. <laughs> Dude, a good example of that is um that uh that movie that had Harry Styles in it. Um Oh yeah, I didn't see that, but yeah, I know it's something you mean. darling with Florence Pugh yeah. and Harry Styles. When it came out, you know, it got all this press. Olivia Wilde was in it too. She directed it, I think. Yep. Um, it had all this press, and when it came out, like there was this whole drama of Harry Styles and Olivia Wilde. Like uh, I don't remember, how, but it got like panned yeah. in all the reviews. Yep. Everyone was like, "This is the worst movie ever." Like whatever. That's right. And Miranda and I didn't watch it for like. I don't know, like a year and a half after. And like, we were just like out of everything to watch. And we're like, I don't know. It's got a bunch of hot people in it. So at the very least, like we get to watch a bunch of hot people. Um, And (laughs) we watched it and it was great. I like really enjoyed it. And for sure, if I had just read a review about like how terrible this movie was, I definitely would have gone into it with like, this is bad, but like I didn't remember any of that. And I was just like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like I like Olivia Wilde. I like Harry Styles. I've seen Florence Pugh and things that I really like. So sure, let's go for it. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah. My list of media consumption, you know, is pretty high. And so I, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't let a review of that. Like I'm thinking back to that and it didn't make me want to never see it or be like, this is going to be bad, but it was just more of like, well, I'm not going to go out of my way like right now Yeah, to totally. consume this thing. Like maybe later, maybe someday, whatever. Okay. Well, we are getting like into that time range, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I definitely wanted to, uh, you being the guest that I uh, spontaneously demanded needed to be the 007 <laughs> episode person, um, even though we uh, are on record on your podcast as discussing uh, the finer points of Mad oh, Men yeah. in depth, you are a James Bond guy and I am. I'm not even close, so like I knew that I wasn't going to go into having you as the 007 guest and be like, we're going to talk a fuck ton about James Bond. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of make a pivot from that last thing we were talking about. Uh, let's talk about Bond songs. Okay. And uh, what to you makes an effective James Bond song? A song that is that feels James Bond, which I think like... Well, what all does of, that mean? <laughs> I mean, I think all of us kind of knows like, you know, it's got the... It's got the nods to the Bond vibe, you know? It's big, yeah. it's brassy. I don't know, there's just like, it's a certain aesthetic, like a Bond theme song is a certain aesthetic. Um, so it's got that in there, uh-huh. but it also stands alone as a good song. So even if you've never seen the movie, you could hear it and be like, cool song. Kind of sounds like a Bond song. Yeah, sure. Um and to me, like the ones that do it great, like Live and Let Die, I think is a great Bond song because it's not only like you when you see it in the movie, you're like, oh, hell yeah, this is a great Bond song. Uh, uh-huh. You also could hear it on the radio not knowing it's a James Bond song. And you go like, yeah, that's a song. Love it. I feel great about Live and Let Die as a song, but it is the it is like one of the ones I think of as I'm not sure that it does the Bond song the, it, thing, right? A lot of Besides, it is orchestration, right? Like, I think the, like, how yeah, much sure. orchestration there is, it, like, feels cinematic. Um, yes, that is for sure true. I, I would say, like, it feeling cinematic is something that's important. Like, Billie Eilish's theme song, I thought was great. Yep. Goldfinger, yeah, right. I think is great. Oh, yeah. Goldfinger um, is so good. Um, Skyfall is great. Skyfall's fine. Yeah, okay. I well, mean, but I would say, you know, obviously that's that's personally for me. Although yeah. I mean that's how I feel about Live and Let Die. Like dude, that I think it's a fine song, but I think that it I don't think that Live and Let Die is sexy enough to be a Bond song. That is like one of the attributes I think that it misses. Well, there's a couple different kinds of Bond songs though, right? There's ones that are sexy. Shirley Bassey yeah. obviously did a lot of sexy Bond songs. Um yeah. but there's also ones that are just like we're going to get the bad guy. You know what I mean? And those aren't always like as sexy. They're yeah. like, just like, we're going to go get the bad guy or whatever. Um, I think one of the worst is Jack White and, uh, 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 oh, uh yeah. Alicia Keys or, yeah, I think that's right. Or Rihanna or someone. I don't remember who it was, but it was bad. It was not yeah, good. I gotta look that. I gotta look it up real quick. 
Um, uh, oh man, yeah, it was not good. Um, because that that one to me just didn't feel like. Oh it, yeah, it is Alicia Keys. Yeah. yeah, Alicia Keys. Okay. Um, it just didn't feel like any anyone had seen a Bond movie. And the prompt to him <laughs> yeah. might have been like, "Hey, we want to like do something new," because like I think the one that came before that was Chris Cornell, which I personally don't think was, you know. That was for Casino Royale, and I don't think that was a, a great yeah. Bond song. But yeah, I mean, I think they have right. some kind of like cinematic, larger than life James Bondy franchise feeling, but are also just a good song. Yeah, I think the scope is a big deal with that for sure. Like even the ones that are bad to some degree accomplish scope yes. in certain ways for sure. Um, all right, and then so my one other question about Bond is, so who are your top three James Bond actors? Yeah, interesting. I mean, and I don't think there's a right answer. I don't think any of it is objective because, you know, if you're like a child when Roger Moore is the James Bond coming out, you're going to love sure, Roger Moore. Yeah. Like there's so much nostalgia that plays for eras or whatever. Yeah, of course. I think objectively, yeah. I think Daniel Craig has been the best Bond. Um. I think that's true. I think that it, that is right. Best without being favorite r- tracks for me. Yeah. I mean, I think that he has been in the best movies objectively and box office yeah. wise. And I also just think that like he's brought a, a range to the character that has been non-existent. Um, I think uh, so. I think, and I think he, at this point he probably is like of uh, like so much of this does get gauged with like again like non musicians are sometimes the best judges of music non bond yeah. fans are sometimes the best judges of bond like my wife will tolerate bond movies but she will watch any <laughs> daniel craig james bond cuz they're not just good uh-huh. bond movies they're good movies <laughs> yeah sure um yeah yeah so i think craig is probably my number 1 um, yeah. Brosnan would be number two just because I was 10 when he was James yep. Bond. I think, and I think he's great. I th- think he does a good job. At last it. time you, you, you took a look at Die Another Day, <laughs> go back and revisit <laughs> Die Another Day, Harry, Halle Berry in the Ice Palace. Um, oh, yeah, that, okay, that's part of that. Yeah, I think Goldeneye is objectively like a great movie and a great Bond yeah. movie. So, yeah. Brosnan would definitely be my number two, and then I, I feel like. Connery would be my number three only because I feel like Dr. No and well, I don't know. I think Dr. No is like Dr. Yeah. Dr. No is probably top five James Bond movies for me just because it's like, yeah, so Dr. No's great. It's like, so that, how did you do it the first time out of the gate? How did you establish like what the whole thing would be? I mean, yeah. that's crazy. Um, yeah, I agree. We have the same three in that case. It really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. The other ones, they don't do it for me. I know my mom likes one or the other of them, like, just fine, but... I think think Dalton's movies have aged a little bit better for me, only in that they're, like, very 80s, and they were a little darker, not quite as misogynistic, and, like, uh, (laughs) I mean, not quite as misogynistic yeah right yeah is, but that's that is high praise <laughs> yeah. for the character you know like, yeah uh yeah some of the connery ones are pretty rough to watch but i think that that's like well, that's that's art imitating life as well well yeah but i think that's one of the interesting things about a franchise that's been around that long is like and, and there are like bond fans that like don't seemingly don't want people to like point out the like very obvious like horrible (laughs) things that are sometimes included in the franchise like yeah racism and misogyny like aren't good uh no it's okay to point them out if the movie was made in the 60s it's it's not okay that they existed but it's okay now to look back and go wow this is a product of that time period that's insane that this was yeah, right. anything we would ever put in a movie and like you can still like the movie and s- also still be like I really wish they hadn't <laughs> treated women yeah, like that's, this. <laughs> that's the mature middle ground because the other the two ends of the spectrum are saying like don't point it out you're going to ruin it yeah. or you know making those film reels disappear. Right for all time because of the thing like that is what you're describing is the mature middle ground and it is so much that way of 
any issue yeah that way and, of, and again i just think like you're doing yourself a disservice if it has to be one or the other like it can it both things can be true it can be a fun movie that's nostalgic for you and it can contain a ton of things that aged very 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 poorly <laughs> and they yeah. did and it does <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right with that that'll uh that'll do it for this time man thank you so much for uh hopping on in short order and uh thanks for being here oh thanks for having me man this is great ah uh, yes what a nice chat with tim buell if you couldn't possibly get enough of us and want to hear more of me and Tim talking, you can head to his podcast called Your Good, Get Better, and head on down, scroll for a little bit, and find episode 74, in which Tim and I do a sort of draft of each of our five favorite musical moments from the show Mad Men. That is highly likely to be the least listened to episode of his podcast, but we had a great time, and even if you've never seen Mad Men, I think that chat still holds up even a few years later. We also have some music with some friends that we're making, and that'll be out sometime, and you will hear about it when it happens. If you're looking for even more Tim, you can find him at his website. That is timbuellmusic.com. On Instagram, he is simply Tim Buell. Uh, probably from those spots on the podcast, you can find anywhere else that you need to track him down. Around the internet for me, you can find the show on Instagram at Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know. I am at Matt O'Donnell for my own zany page. Questions, comments, concerns, feedback, whatever can be emailed to the show. That is Matt O'Donnell Wants to Know at gmail.com. Don't forget, liking, subscribing, sharing, telling your friends is a whole barrel of laughs that gets me more places that I want to go in the style that we just talked about for the entirety of that chat. It's all helpful, and I am so thankful for every one of you. I did a cool thing the past couple weeks, and I got some stickers made of the show artwork. I'm in no position to have a storefront yet to sell them. Does anyone really want to buy them? I'm not sure, but they're fun and they give me something to give to people when I want to tell them that I have the show and I don't want to solely rely on their memory to remember to look it up at some point. I can give them the sticker and hopefully that'll jog their memory like tying a string around your finger for that whole old school reminder vibe. If you find in your heart that you desperately want one, send me an email at the show email and we'll work some sort of thing out. That's going to do it for this time. I hope you're ready to hear a little more of Tim via his drumming. Be sure and take care of yourself. And remember, the best answer to a question is usually another question. Hit me with that drum fill, Tim Buell. See ya. See ya.